Welcome English 1102 friends. This is a video taking you through a pair of the nature and setting poems. Uh, we're going to go through Traveling Through the Dark by William Stafford and then Woodchucks by Maxine Cumin. Um, both of these poems, there's an obvious connection between these poems, both of these poems deal with animals and honestly in a you know dark way uh, dead animals. Um, one though in a much more sort of tender sad way um, and then woodchucks in a less tender way in like uh, t time to kill the woodchucks and the mission of killing the woodchucks becomes just that this mission this obsession with this suburban mom um, there's also very particular settings to both of these poems traveling through the dark the setting is this mountain road uh, at night woodchucks is this much more what feels like a homey it, it, you have this sort of suburban neighborhood little house and then this mom um, this suburban mom come ends up with a rifle killing the woodchucks so we'll start with traveling through the dark which in, on a basic level is a sadder poem but there is this sort of reflective sad this deer died moment um, traveling through the dark I found a deer dead on the edge of Wilson River Road okay so we're on Wilson River Road we're traveling through the dark and then here's the deer dead it is usually best to roll them in the can into the canyon. The road is narrow. To swerve might make more dead. And if you've ever driven on a sort of twisty, turning mountain road, you know what he's talking about here. The road is narrow, it's curvy, and it's dark also. Um, and so on one side, there's just the, you know, the steep drop off, drop off down into a canyon. On the other side, there's the side of the mountain. So there's really nowhere to swerve to get around a, a dead animal on the road. You swerve one way, you're going to hit the side of the mountain. You swerve the other way, you're going to run off the side of the mountain down into this canyon. By glow of the tail, and so, and that's what drives the action here. Um, the speaker in the poem knows that he that having this deer in the road is dangerous, and so he pulls over. By glow of the tail light, I stumbled back of the car and stood by the heap, a doe, a recent killing. So it's a female deer, um, and, and it's just died. You know, she had stiffened already, almost cold. I dragged her off. She was large in the belly. Um, so he goes to, you know, try to drag her, roll her, into, roll her down the canyon. Um, but he's big, and my fingers touching her side brought me the reason. Her side was warm. Her fawn lay there waiting, alive, still, never to be born. Beside that mountain road, I hesitated. And so he, he, he was going to just throw this deer, you know, as quick as he could. No thought, just get, this, get, the, get the body out of the road and then move on. Um, but he has this sort of moment of sadness, this moment of reflection, because he realizes it's not just one deer that died here. It's two. And this baby, um, this fawn that's never going to be born, there's this moment of sadness about it. Then what is maybe the most interesting stanza of the whole poem, the car aimed ahead its lowered parking lot. So it's like that line is about the car and the industrial world, the human world, civilization. Under the hood purred the steady engine. Again, more car, civilization, the concerns of civilization. I stood in the glare of the warm exhaust turning red. More car imagery, more like human um, around our group, I could hear the wilderness listen. And so then that last line, it's the wilderness, the deer, nature kind of listening. And so what you get in this is this contrast between civilization and the human world and human concerns and sort of the deer and the wilderness and all that stuff. I thought hard for all of us, my only swerving. So he swerves off course just because he has this moment of sadness. You know, metaphorically, he swerves um, away from his sort of mission to be as quick as he can then pushed her over the edge into the river. And so he ha you know, he jumps out, he knows he's gotta be quick, because him being out there, he could get hit by a car or cause a wreck. And so he knows, to, he knows he needs to move as quick as he can, but he has this moment of hesitation, moment of reflection, moment of sadness, because uh, he, he discovers that the deer was on the verge of having a baby, um, and now neither, you know, the deer is dead and the baby will never be born. So it is this sort of sad moment of sadness in the middle of doing this very practical thing. That's very different than Woodchucks by Maxine Cumin um, because this is very clearly about getting rid of a pest. You know, the Woodchucks are pests and she decides she has to get rid of them. Um, unfortunately, like a lot of pests, like, like if you have, you know, you get mice or, or rodents or something like that, they're harder to get rid of than she expects. 
gassing the woodchucks didn't turn out right. So she, the, the first thing she tries doesn't work. The knockout bomb from the feed and grain exchange was featured as merciful. Quick at the bone, and the case we had against them was airtight. Both exits shoehorned shut with pudding stone. But they had a sub-sub basement out of range. And so she's going to get this gas bomb, drop it down the hole, cover all the holes she can find with rocks, and be like, this will take care of it. Quick and painless. You know, no no dead dead woodchuck bodies around. She's like, she's just gonna drop this little gas bomb in there, fumigate them, and it'll be done. But it doesn't work. And next morning they turned up again, no worse for the cyanide than we for our cigarettes and state store scotch, all of us up to scratch. So she sort of makes a joke. She's like, the gas bomb didn't really do anything but give them a buzz, you know, like a cigarette and some whiskey. They brought down the marigolds as a matter of course and then took over the vegetable patch, nipping the broccoli shoots, beheading the carrots. Here's the pest part of it, the infestation, why she wants to get rid of them, why, why she hates them and wants to kill them is they're in her vegetables. They're in her vegetable garden and they're, you know, they're, um, they're killing her, both her flowers and her vegetables. Um, and, and so now she's like, all right, now it's real. They push back, they're eating my food. The food from our mouths, I said, righteously thrilling to the feel of the 22, the bullets, neat noses. So since the gas uh, bomb didn't work on them, now, now she's taking it to the next level. She's got a 22, a uh, little rifle, and she's sitting there, you know, touching the bullets, and it's like, this'll take care of it. I, a lapsed pacifist, fallen from grace, puffed with Darwinian pieties for killing. This is a complicated couple of lines, the lapsed pacifist and the Darwinian pieties. Laps, a pacifist is a person who doesn't believe in violence, doesn't believe in killing, but like this has brought something out of her and she's like, I'm not a pacifist anymore, I'm ready to kill over this. And the Darwinian pieties, one of, Darwin's, one of Charles Darwin's central scientific principles is survival of the fittest. And she's like, time for the fittest to time for the fittest to kill the less fit. In her case, she's got the rifle. She's going to kill the woodchucks. Now drew a bead on, bead on the little woodchuck's face. He died down in the ever-bearing roses. And so there, now she's ready. She kills the first one. Ten minutes later, I dropped the mother. She flip-flopped in the air and fell, her needle teeth still hooked in the leaf of early swift chard. So she, it's almost like she catches one of them in the act, kills them in the act of eating her greens. Another baby next. One, two, three, the murderer inside me rose up hard. The Hawkeye killer came on stage forthwith. And so it's almost like she killed, the, the, the killing of the woodchucks just wakes something up in her and she's like, oh yeah, um, I'm ready now. There's one Chuck left, old wily fellow. He keeps me cocked and ready day after day after day. And so now it's almost like she's a woodchuck assassin or, or, or some, like a woodchuck sniper. And it's woken something up in her. And she's like, kill, 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 till they're all dead. All night I hunt his humped up form. You can just see this nice suburban mom, you know, up, up sitting on her porch with a rifle at night. Just dangerous. I dream, I sight along the barrel in my sleep. If only they'd all consented to die unseen, gassed underground, the quiet Nazi way. And so at the end, she sort of has, has this feeling of remorse or something that if, if the gas bomb had worked, that whatever, whatever this is wouldn't have come out of her. But since it didn't and she had to take, you know, take it into her own hands, it's like it's woken something up in her. And now, now it's like she says, the Hawkeye killer came on stage forthwith. It's like this nice suburban mom or even grandma has turned into a, you know, killer instinct has come out. So you get very different tones and very different settings in these poems, even though they're both about animals. You know, the traveling through the dark is this moment of surprise and, and sort of sadness, um, the, this, this sort of sad moment before he gets back in the car and is like, I gotta be going. Woodchucks is this sort of the animals and the, the pests and the problems they're causing wakes up the Hawkeye killer inside of her. It's, it's not sadness, it's like murderous intensity or something like that. But both of these poems deal with nature and deal with settings, you know, the, the um, mountain road and then this, this nice like suburban or country yard here. I hope that helps you understand these two poems and see the connections between them. Um, thank y'all.